thank you guys for coming this morning. <coughs> Welcome to the Corporate Hour. Um, I think most everybody knows my name is Jacob Hamba, one of the pastor elders here, and I am the one who happens particularly responsible for our book table. Um, it's been a, a privilege off and on, on and off, really since the start of our church. Um, for we have oversight, direction, and, and really most importantly, benefit from our book table. It's called book table, not like the why you call it book table. There, there are no tables. Uh, back in the very beginning of our church, when we were mobile, leading out of the junior high um, Roadrunner Cafe, as part of our setup, carrying a table and boxes of books, setting them up. Some of the in some ways, selling them out of the back of the junior high to a bunch of young college kids. From the, the very start of our church, we wanted this to be a, a church that reads, a reading church. And, and I think we've only grown in that commitment, in that desire. Your church leaders, your, your elders, your pastors, likely anybody you look up to spiritually, read. And your elders want you to read and read well. So for the next two weeks, I want to talk about reading in the Christians. And not just reading in Christians in general, but speak as one who's benefited personally from reading. Um, many authors have truly been my disciples. I've, I would not be the man that I, I am by God's grace, if it wasn't for the, the books that I have read. And I, as I look out, I, I see many people with, with heads going up and down. That, that's your experience as well. Um, but for the next two weeks, I, I want to skim the surface on, on providing some basic shepherding guidance uh, from my experience and the experience of others to help Grace Bible Church better handle the incredible resources that we've been given in the 21st century as Christians, as readers, an illiterate nation, uh, really with near unlimited resources at our grasp. Before I talk about reading of books, I do want to make the very, very important point that reading of books, even books about the Bible, must not replace reading of the Bible. Reading is super important. God gave us his word in a book. There's very few people throughout history who could believe in Jesus because they saw him. Right? But think of the, the countless millions, including us, who believe even though we can't See, we, we aren't there, but we read God's inspired, infallible word, giving testimony to who Jesus was, who Jesus is, what he did, and what he desires for his people. We, we get to read about that in a book. Uh, reading is important because God gave us his word in a book, but reading, you, you may have fallen prey to this. I know I have at times where reading good things, good books, even books about the Bible can distract you from the Bible. The, the words of, of J.C. Ryle, I would, even as we're talking about, don't be distracted from the Bible by a book. Let me recommend a book to you. It's called How Readest Thou? It's on our, our book table. It's by J.C. Ryle. I'm going to read some, some quotes from really, because he says it better than I can. He says, do not read about the Bible without actually reading the Bible. And yet, your knowledge of the Bible can be increased by, increased by, supplemented by, sharpened by, and your application of it improved through humble discipleship and learning at the feet of well-educated guides. But you must read the Bible. He says, there is no knowledge 
absolutely needful to a man's salvation except the knowledge of the things which are to be found in the Bible. I don't want that statement to drive you away from reading extra books, but if, if you can only have one book, let it be the Bible. Um, and let your reading of other books be, I'd say, primarily focused on what he describes humble discipleship and learning at the feet of well-educated guides. Let your, your primary knowledge, your primary desire in reading to be God's word and let the other words that you read drive you back to God's word or inform you of the, word, of the world that the God of the word made. Um, maybe sharpen your thinking about God's word. J.C. Ryle continued, he said, a man may have prodigious learning and yet never be saved, right? You can master all the books in the world. And if you don't master the Bible, you will not be saved. He may master half the languages spoken around the globe. He may be acquainted with the highest and deepest things in heaven and earth. He may read books till he is like a walking encyclopedia. He may be familiar with the stars of heaven, the birds of the air, the beasts of the earth, the fishes of the sea. He may be able to speak of plants from the cedars of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows on the wall. He may be able to discourse all the secrets of fire, air, earth, and water. And yet, if he dies ignorant of the Bible's truths, he dies an ignorant man. A man may be a very ignorant man, and yet be saved. He may be, able, he may be unable to read a word or write a letter, and yet if that very man has heard Bible truths with his ears and believed it with his heart, he knows enough to save his soul. Knowledge of the Bible, in short, is the one knowledge that is needful. A man may get to heaven without money, without learning, without health or friends, but without Bible knowledge, he will never get there at all. A man may have the mightiest of minds and a memory stored with all that a mighty man can grasp. And yet, if he does not know the things of the Bible, he will make a shipwreck of his soul forever. Woe, woe, woe to the man who dies in ignorance of the Bible. So, overarching banner over everything we talk about. Do not read about the Bible or do not read things besides the Bible without actually reading the Bible. And yet, the, these things should not be pit against each other. Rather, they should be mutually edifying Bible knowledge helping your reading, your reading helping your, your Bible knowledge. We're going to learn that reading is, is training your mind to think. Reading is uh, really train. it's a discipline that will benefit your knowledge of reading of and application of the Bible. And yet, you probably know people, I know many sad examples, that there are many who think that by reading they've accomplished something. They, they read to puff themselves up. They read, um, I could go on, on. They, they read for many, many, many other reasons besides to get the God of the word and to fill themselves uh, with that, that knowledge that really the only important knowledge that, that we must prioritize, the knowledge of God and the gospel by which we are saved. But I don't want to, to discourage us. Rather, I want to encourage us uh, to read and read rightly. Good books set within a context of regular Bible reading serve as an aid and not a hindrance to reading the Bible. Being a better reader, right? It's, it's sort of, it, we live in a, in a country where we are taught to read from very young age. We, we use it in our house. You, you have to learn to read and then you can read to learn. 
learning to read was the first and most important thing. I wouldn't say that. It was one of the first in education, one of the, the very first foundational skills in the education of our kids. Because without being able to read, it's very, very, very hard to learn. And given that God's word, God's truths are given to us not in pictures, not in movies, not even in experiences, but in a book, that skill is critically important. To give them really the basis, to give them a a knowledge foundation that lets them open up God's word for themselves, the very thing that the Holy Spirit would love to use to save them, the very thing that the Holy Spirit would love to use to not only save, but to sanctify you. So being a better reader in general improves our ability to understand and be affected by the written word. Just stand back. Think of just the the short, the small amount of books we have on the book table, much less the, the millions and millions of books that are available to order, to buy, to go to the the library, to check out. We have the opportunity to sit at the feet of some of the most accomplished, thoughtful, intelligent, godly, fill-in-the-blank adjective people uh, that you can imagine and learn from them. Rene Descartes said, the reading of all good books is like a conversation with the finest minds of the past century. If you had a chance to sit at the feet of somebody you looked up to, somebody who had spent a lifetime studying a topic that you wanted to know about, studying a passage that you wanted to understand better, maybe lived a life that you want to emulate or live the life that you really want to avoid emulating. But especially one of those positive, um, those positive role models, you would probably jump at the chance to spend 15 minutes with them. Can I just talk to you? Can I see what makes you tick? I want to learn from you. You've, you've gone through the trial I'm about to go through. You've lived an experience that surely had to shape you in a way that I need to be impacted by. You know more than me about this topic. Can you teach me? And we would jump at the chance to to sit at their feet for 15 minutes. And I know sometimes I I have a hard time sitting down and, and I have the opportunity to learn from them, not just stream of consciousness, but learn from their best thinking, their refined thoughts that many times have survived uh, the test of, test of time. Centuries old. Uh, and we've seen the impact of those words, that wisdom on lives. We ought not neglect this. John Piper writes in When I Don't Desire God, he said, one way to think about Christian books he, he was speaking of Christian books by dead authors, and this is all authors, but certainly don't neglect the dead ones, even pursue them. One way to think about Christian books is that they are the ministry of the body of Christ across the centuries, and not, oh, sorry, and not just across the miles. We are meant to learn the meaning of scriptures from Christian teachers out of the pulpit and out of the past. None of us is so free from sin or bias or blindness that we can see the infallible scriptures infallibly. We need help. We need correction. We need guidance. We need encouragement. Oh, the wonders that others have seen in the Bible that we have not seen. And what a folly and blow if we neglect these books. Many are the greatest God-given helpers in our quest for joy or many of the greatest God-given helpers in our quest for joy are dead, but God has preserved their helpfulness in books. Harry Truman said, not all readers are leaders, but all leaders are readers. I, I believe that is true. 
And if you consider the godliest people that you know, I, I know for a fact it's, it would be descriptive of, of all of the, the elders in this church, but I don't know any godly men that I look up to that I have wanted to emulate where I haven't been surprised. I don't know why I'm surprised, but surprised in some degree by the fact that they have been mastered by books. They are readers. There is, and, and this I don't think is, is just happenstance. If you think about your life and in, in just life in general, there is a very strong connection between the way you think and the way you live. And there's no stronger positive influence for me personally on the way I think than by reading and diligently interacting with good books with the goal to be rightly affected by their content. Right, you might be arguing, and I, I hope that as you listen to me, you do what you do when you read a good book. You argue with it. You think about it. You don't just passively receive. And you might say, oh, I know a lot of people who read a ton, and I don't want to be anything like them. And that, that's not the fault of the book. It, it might be if you read the wrong thing, and we're going to go into this read purposefully. Be careful what you, what you read. But also be careful how you read. Right? It's not merely enough to put the good thoughts into your mind, but just like one can come to God's word, like the Pharisees, you come to God's word, you, you read it because you think in it, there's, you're going to find eternal life, Jesus said, but, but you refuse to come to me that you may have life. You can open up God's word every day and be unaffected by it. Right? The, the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. Be a, a soil that receives the word and, and bears up fruit. Pray that God would make you that, make your heart that kind of heart as you read God's word and as you read other books. It's very possible to be filled with knowledge and have that knowledge puff you up. Right? It's very possible to be filled with knowledge and think, oh, I now have the knowledge. I have accomplished what I need to accomplish. That, the knowledge isn't the goal, but the knowledge is the means to shepherd your heart. The knowledge is the means to affect the way that you live. So don't stop at reading. Don't stop at reading, but, but you have to read. Reading isn't sufficient. Just like reading God's word isn't shepherding your heart, reading isn't shepherding your heart. You must Re reading God's word isn't living godly, but you're going to have a really hard time shepherding your heart, living a godly life, and knowing the God revealed in his word if you don't read it. You're going to be better equipped to do those same things if you make a consistent practice of, of exposing your mind, training your mind, not only with God's word, but with good books well read. Reading is not sufficient, but I would argue that it, it's necessary. It's a tragedy, John Piper writes in that same book, that hard thinking has come to be associated with cold thoughts. This has not been the experience of the greatest Christian mind. Delight and study have gone hand in hand. And I would, I would encourage you to not only as a result of this, say, okay, I need to read more, but make sure that you're reading rightly. Finally, last point is before we get into, uh, into my outline. This is a, a prolonged introduction to, to why this matters. We, uh, we live in an age now where we have more information at our fingertips than, than ever before. But if you think of the way that that is primarily presented to us, it's TikTok, Twitter, Reels, dopamine-stimulating short clips of information, short blips that are not meant to be pondered, not meant to change you, but designed to just 
give you enjoyment as you passively receive them. That kind of information will affect you, but it probably won't generate the effect of godliness, the effect of love, the, affle- the effect of discipline and diligence and thinking, acting, living. It probably won't result in self-control. It probably won't result in well thought through, firmly held convictions that will stand in the face of trial. Uh, reading and reading well teaches you how to think. All the information around us, we, we say, oh, I, I don't need to read because I can get anything I need on Google or chat GPT. If I, if I have a question, I can just get the answer. And having the information is quite different than understanding the information. Receiving thoughts are different than understanding. We can be so inundated with facts that they can become a detriment to understanding. Have you felt that? I have. I, I want to learn about something, and I learn so many facts about it, and then two hours later, I'm no closer to understanding. And that tends to come from a kind of reading and an interacting with things that has me flitting from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. Short blips where I'm the recipient rather than interacting with a, with a book. Mortimer Adler, I, I would recommend this book to you. It's called How to Read a Book. It's a good one. He, uh, he writes on this topic. He says, perhaps we know more about the world than we used to. This was written more than 50 years ago. And insofar as knowledge is prerequisite to understanding, that's all to the good. But knowledge is not as much a prerequisite to understanding as is commonly supposed. We do not have to know everything about something in order to understand it. Too many facts are often as much of an obstacle to understanding as too few. And there is a sense in which we moderns are inundated with facts to the detriment of understanding. Convictions, so, sorry, so, so in, the, in the TikTok fast-paced, we're just going to read a snippet. We, how often when you pull up something on your smartphone, do you read longer than one, two, three paragraphs? Sometimes we're trained to have the attention span of an, of an ant not even getting through, through a sentence. Be aware of that. And in your reading, fight that, that which culture is the, it's not a bad thing around us, but it, it is the thing around us. Might be training your mind to do. That kind of knowledge, that kind of receipt of information, thinking, facts, just whatever you're, you're receiving maybe entertainment, I mentioned it, it's, it's not going to lead to a, a type of conviction that will stand the trial, the trials that you might face. It, not, it probably won't lead to the kind of conviction that'll help you persevere with the daily disciplines that will lead to godliness that, that the Christians required in the good times and the hard Albert Moeller, in his uh, book, Conviction to Lead, he has a whole chapter on reading. It's a good one. He, he says, convictions are honed and enriched through reading, especially when that reading is filtered through the kind of worldview analysis that Christian leaders must develop and deploy. The careful reader is not reading merely to receive data, but the leader learns to invest deeply in reading as a discipline for critical thinking. Nebulous thoughts. You you might think that you know a lot about a topic because you've heard a lot of things about it, you've seen it. But nebulous thoughts and general ideas can become crystallized as you read on a topic and read well. 
interacting with the content, and then when you're done, being able to explain what you read, to be able to teach it to your own heart, and then to the hearts of, of others, those who you might influence. That's hard to do when you're being a passive recipient of knowledge. And finally, uh, reading is a, is a discipline. It's like uh, exercising. Your, your mind is like a muscle. You should expect that, you should expect opposition from your heart, right? If you're, your heart knows that, well, your, your heart's not going to want that which is hard. Your heart's just like working out. You know that it's good for you. You might know that reading's good for you, but, but without the discipline of making it happen, you likely won't do it. And if you don't do it, that muscle will atrophy and it, it won't become better. It won't become stronger. If you have a hard time reading big chunks of scripture, if you have a hard time synthesizing huge chunks of scripture, it might just mean that, well, first make sure it, it, that your heart is right before the Lord. That's a necessary precursor. But, but it might just mean that, that the muscle of your mind is atrophied. If the only time of the day that you're trying to exercise the muscle of your mind in diligent reading is, I need to open my Bible in the morning, and, and you find you can't have the attention span to read for 15 minutes? Are you using that muscle other times throughout the day? That muscle of your mind? Reading is a discipline, and it requires self-discipline. And y- your, your mind might be eager to read a book but your flesh is weak, untrained. And uh, so let me, let me encourage you, if, if you're not a reader, I, I hope that, that you don't come up with a to-do list today and next week, but, but you're convinced, I, I, need to, I need to add this to my life. There's a, there's a saying, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, so it'd be nice and big and strong. And the second best time is today. Right, if, if you don't have, have the tree, if you don't have that skill of reading. So to get better at, at reading, you have to do it. Uh, let's pop up the outline. We're going to, for the next, uh, next the, today and then next week, I'm going to talk through seven habits of a good Christian reader. Um, We're going to say reading, you must be purposeful, be humble, be consistent, be active, be discerning, be applicative, and be delighted. Come up with a lot more things that you should be as a reader, but, but this is, this is me. This is, this is my framework. These are the ways that I try to guide my own reading and it's proven fruitful over the years, and I'd, I'd encourage you um, to take this, may, maybe be encouraged, refine your, your reading and, and your, um, your purposes in reading as we go. So let's start with be purposeful. What do I mean for, for be purposeful? As you read, don't just read whatever crosses your lap, whatever you got sent in the mail, whatever the hot topic of the day is, or whatever tickles your fancy, jumping from one thing to the next. But be purposeful in choosing your book. What are you going to read? When you go back to the the book table, or you go on Amazon, or you go to the church library, be purposeful. And it's not only about being purposeful in the book that you're reading right now, but it's, reading can be like a well-rounded diet. You need lots of different nutrients. Yes, you need protein, but you also need the vitamins. You need not just one vitamin, but multiple. Any deficiency will be seen, maybe not today, but over chron- chronically over time. You'll start to see one area of your life, one area of your thinking being deficient. So be purposeful as you choose books. What, what's the standard by which you, you can be purposeful. Be, read a wide variety. 
aiming at what? Uh, Tim Chalice has four categories that he aims at. He says he wants to read to know, read to grow, read to lead, and read to love. I think that's simple. Read to know, fix areas of knowledge that are deficient. Make sure that he knows a wide variety. Especially say, where am I deficient in my reading? Am I reading only about one topic? What, what do I anticipate I'm going to need to know? Let's, let's make sure I'm strengthening that area. Read to grow. It's not enough to, where am I practically deficient in life? How can I be benefiting there? Read to lead. Um, you, you aren't going just, we talk about this all the time in Build, Wellspring. Uh, don't read primarily for the benefit of others. That should be a warning sign to you. But others are going to benefit from your reading. As you read and you internalize a topic and you're able to really care for your own heart, preach, preach its content, teach its content to yourself, you're going to be well positioned to help your, your friend, help your children, help your spouse. Or with, with that content, or maybe be changed to be the kind of man, the kind of woman uh, that's going to be able to, to help them, to lead them, to direct them towards godliness. And then read to love. Uh, love God, love, love others. Tony Renke has six categories. So we had Chalice, read to know, grow, lead, love. I like Renke's. He has first, read scripture. Two, read to know and delight in Christ. And make sure that, that your books are you're not going to have one book that covers all of these. And to read in one of these categories will, will likely leave, read, leave you deficient. And these are in, in order of decreasing importance for him. Read scripture. Read to know and delight in Christ. Read to kindle spiritual reflection. Read to initiate personal change. Read to pursue vocational excellence. And read to enjoy a good story. Those come from his pretty good book, Lit. Uh, L-I-T, like literature, exclamation mark. Good book about Christian and reading. Uh, so those are, those are helpful. My, my personal categories that I'm going to spend a little more time on, on the per, as, I'm, as I personally am purposeful in my reading. Um, and I have, I have a note file. I've had it for years of all the books that I read. I could go back, show you all the books that I've read for the last 20 years. And, and I do that not to look back and say, oh, look what I've accomplished, but, but actually to put in these categories to say, where am, I, where am I deficient? I seem to be reading a lot about a topic. What perspective am I not considering? Um, and I, I actually read multiple books. This is my personal practice that I found helpful. Read multiple books at one time that cross all of these. Because sometimes a good book takes, takes a while. And it's going to be affecting your thinking, affecting your life for a good chunk of time. There's plenty of books I've read that, I mean, it is, my, it is I'm working hard through that thing for over a year. I pick from multiple categories at once, uh, reading these in, in different settings. But, but my first, that I have to, ha I personally am reading at all times. And I, I would encourage this to you is, I call it worship-inducing or heart shepherding. These are books by, by trusted authors. Not, not that I won't have to be discerning, but books by, by trusted authors, usually dead authors, because I, I, know, <laughs> I know the result of their line of thinking and that it's, it's persevered till the end. Um, these usually aren't the, the books, the recently published books, right? The, these are the... These, these are the books I, I can trust because people I trust have testified to them and I've seen the outcome in their life. These are a lot of Puritans in these, in these categories. Um, in this category, it's worship-inducing heart shepherding. Second is knowledge-expanding theoretical. So, so this first one, worship-inducing heart shepherding, very much tied to Scripture. It's going to be putting scripture in front of me every day, helping me. Uh, uh, it's basically like we read earlier. Uh, one of the 
the men that I look up to throughout history sitting down and personally discipling me to love the Lord and to live a godly life. I want that in front of me every day, in including my, um, my diet of, of God's word. But then if that's all that I'm doing, th- there's a depth to that. And sometimes those are deep theological books. I don't pit the deep thinking with that heart shepherding, worship inducing, but I, I want that to be something I, I don't have to work real, real hard at. I want that to just care for my heart and have a practice of keeping my heart soft as I read. But then second category for me is, is knowledge expanding or theoretical. Uh, that, that would go like t- Chally's Read to Know or um, the uh, Read to, to Know Cry. I, I guess that, that Renke has that through everything, but Chally's Read to Know, for me, the second category is knowledge expanding or theoretical. This may or may not be a Christian book it may or may not be um, theological. I would be cautious about making your reading ex- uh, neglecting deep theology. Make a regular practice of taking a, a category of something that you don't know about and saying, I'm going to be purposeful to pick that up. And then as you do, and, and you won't be able to do this all at once. This is going to take a lifetime and you're going to have to be content. But be purposeful as you pick your books. And, and so I found, like I said, that habit of looking at all the books, categorizing them, reviewing periodically, where am I deficient? Where do I anticipate I'm going to need to know something? Um, and reading those books. Uh, sometimes, like I said, most those certainly include theological books, but, but that would include for me like, hey, I, as we were fighting, uh, making important decisions relating to cancer, I need to learn a lot about that. Or um, a health topic, I need to learn a lot about that. Or there's a particular a world event that I want to understand. I need to, I need to, uh, know, I need to expand my knowledge there. The third would be, so I have worship-inducing, knowledge-expanding. Third is life-shepherding, or life-changing. Uh, that's like a practical or an application. Some of those books would be like helping me be a better husband, father, pastor, uh, we, we, had, we had one of those as the book of the month last month, Run to Win by Tim Challies. Great, great book, very practical. Um, they might be related to your job. They might be related, but uh, make sure that they aren't related exclusively to your job. Uh, just practical how-tos. Sometimes those would be biographies, men that you want to, or lives that you want to follow, emulate, not emulate. Biographies, histories books uh, by an author that you're wanting to understand better. So I have worship-inducing, knowledge-expanding, life-changing. Uh, worldview refining would be my fourth category. Those would be usually books to help me understand the time that I live in. I, we are uh, affected more than we know by a recency bias. It, it's that which is going on right now. If you think of like the crises of three years ago, six years ago, 10 years ago, it felt in your mind like it was all that there was. Uh, Reading outside of your time and backing up from the urgent and helping to refine your worldview to help you interact with the crisis of the day, whether it was BLM or pandemics or wars or political crises or the theological um, attack that uh, attacks or debates of the of the day. Um, read stuff to, to help refine your worldview, um, historical, political, theological. Make sure you choose uh, a time not, or it's especially helpful to to read from people that are in a time not our own. And then finally, just for fun, um, enjoy reading. And so those those would be. Uh, be careful uh, with, with uh, the fun reading. It, don't avoid it. Enjoy reading. You, you, the more that you just enjoy picking up a book and reading it, the, there, isn't, there should be a lot of, not a strict, or there should be a ton of overlap over these categories. Uh, worship-inducing books should be fun to read. It should hurt a little bit. 
Because when you see God revealed, you're going to see sin revealed, and you have to repent. You have to confess. You have to apply. As your knowledge expands, it's hard work. It's hard work to change, uh, change your thinking, change your worldview. Um, and you want to do that, not separate from shepherding your heart or, or worshiping God. Uh, you don't want to, a how-to without understanding the practical. There's going to be tons of overlap but, but between these categories. But, but the purpose, the, the overall arching thing that I'm saying here is be purposeful in what you read and how you read it. Be cautious. Good books are like sitting at the feet of a good teacher. And that's one of the most effective ways to sharpen your thinking. But bad books or bad teachers is one of the fastest ways to lead you astray. No matter what you're reading, you're going to be devoting a big, big chunk of time, a big, big chunk of your, of your mind to be influenced, even if you're reading critically, to be influenced by that author. And if they have a worldview other than, your, other than, than the biblical one, if they have, uh, nobody except for God's word is going to be um, infallible, obviously. And, and nothing other than God's word should be read without a discerning mind. And even in God's word, you have to, you have to read it for understanding. But be cautious because bad books can lead you astray very, very quickly. I often choose to read books I disagree with, but make sure that you explicitly Set at, remind yourself, this is, these statements are all tainted by fill in the blank. This rejects God as a worldview. As I read science books, and they are, a lot of them are written by people who know God, and they refuse to honor him as God. And, and they've become futile in their thinking, they've rejected God, and, and God's wrath is, is actually evident against them as they, they look at something that should induce worship and can actually induce worship in me as I, I learn about the way that the body works or the universe works or fill in the blank scientific topic. But these, these writers are coming from it with an anti-God presupposition. If you don't identify that, it's very easy to, over time, be led astray. But that doesn't mean there's not great knowledge to be to be held, to be gathered in, in reading those. Um, there's, there's a lot of common grace to be had, but just be careful. Understand that you're swimming in shark-infested waters, so swim cautiously. So be purposeful about what you read, which book you're going to read today, and what books you're going to read overall. And be purposeful to make a plan. First, plan to read the book in front of you. Have you ever picked a book up and said, I'm so excited to read this? And then like a month later, you're on page five. What, what happened? You, you, didn't, you didn't plan. And if you, if you don't plan, you're, you're likely not going to do, especially if, it's, if you're not in this habit. So make a plan to read the book in front of you. That's why every month, for every book of the month, we, just in case you didn't know, we have a book of the month every month. There's actually a write-up that comes out the, the first week of the month or, or the last Sunday or the first Sunday of, of each month that has a quick summary of the books, a highlight of, of why you should, should read it, an outline of, or a, a reading summary of about how many pages you have to read each, week, each day and uh, how you can accomplish that in one month. And that's intentional. It's just to, to have a plan. If you just sit down and say, I have to be on this page by the end of this week, and you set aside time, even if you did no other reading than that, at the end of a year, you'll have read 12 really good books. I'd encourage you, that's, that's aiming pretty low. But even if you did that and you just planned, I'm going to minimally read the book of the month, in a month, each month, and follow the plan. That's great but plan to read the book in front of you. However you best accomplish the things that you plan, for me, it's putting it on my task list. I, I actually have a, a checklist every day. It's things I have to do in, in three different spots. In, in all of my planners, it's, did I read? It's, did I read God's word? I have things I'm praying for, and I actually have the books I'm reading in my task managers, just so that it doesn't become something that I forget to do. 
you do that long enough and you're like, well, this is superfluous. Why do I even have it in there? I just know I have to do that. But for me personally, it keeps me from um, falling into patterns of, of neglecting reading. So we, we plan, plan to read the book in front of you, plan to read lots of books. That, that list that we come up with, a list isn't going to help you if you don't actually have a, a plan to, to knock through it. Come up with your plan for the year at the beginning of the year or come up with a plan for the next six months. Here's the books I want to read in the next six months. How am I going to physically accomplish that? Make a plan. Uh, be purposeful by, by evaluating your reading. Like I said, that, that wide variety. Don't chase the urgent, but be content to slowly educate yourself over the years with the important. Read to purposefully augment your weaknesses, and, but don't be afraid to read what you need now. If there's something pretty pressing, uh, get that in front of you. So be purposeful. We had be purposeful in choosing your book or the books that you're going to read. I'd say be purposeful in your speed of reading. So something that, that I didn't get pretty early on that, that's come to me. I'm probably just dumb. I, it's pretty obvious. You're not going to read all books at the same speed. Francis Bacon once remarked, he said, some books are to be tasted, others swallowed, and a few to be chewed and digested. There's, there's some books that are just okay to go fast through, there's some books you probably really shouldn't do that with. And some books are different, where you're able to go fast and you hit a section. Oh, this is new to me. Oh, this is challenging my thinking. Oh, I'm not sure about this. Or, oh man, I really, really need this. That's where you slow down, pencil out. You're highlighting, you're writing, you're interacting with the text. There's, there's different speeds. So be purposeful in, in the speed of reading and then the type of reading. There's some books that, that you can skim. I, I just need to know what this is about. There's other books that you need to be really analytical about. And then there's other books that you have to master. You're going to read those differently. There's some subjects that you just should, should know, yep, that's out there. I need to be familiar with it. There's others that you, you really need to know. And there's others that you need to be able to teach. And you're going to read differently depending on which one it is. So identify in advance, okay, this is one of those books. And then as a result of those decisions, um, choose, on, choose the format. I, I know lots of, lots of people only ever read dead trees. I personally have a really hard time. I, I, I personally have get more long-term retention out of reading on this. And I know not everybody is like that. Know your personal, um, your personal bent, but based on what the purpose of your reading and then being purposeful in the type of reading, the depth of your reading, choose the format of your reading. There's some of the skim kind of books or the, I need to just be familiar with the content here. Great for audiobooks. Oh, but man, if you want to dive deep, if you want to really consider, interact with the text, you have a hard time with audiobooks, right? We said that sometimes you, go, you have to, a book should be read at one speed and then you need to slow down at a spot. Audiobooks don't really let you do that, right? They're just one speed all the way through. Um, you don't get to pause, you don't get to go back, or you get to go back, but, but there's something different about sitting down, interacting, highlighting. Not better, not worse, just different. And if you're not purposeful and you just say, well, good, that one's on Audible, but this one I have on the shelf or this one, um, be purposeful in the type of reading. If you're choosing, um, for me personally, as, as I choose Dead Tree, so a paper or ebook, there are some books where I, I know I'm going to need to scribble. You need to be referencing, flipping back and forth. Maybe good for a dead tree. There's others for, for me where there's lots and lots of verse references where I really enjoy opening it up in Lagos and being able to have a Bible on another pane, my book, and then a note file where I can write, hover over a verse reference, interact with the text, make sure that what they're saying about the verse is right, see it, and then be able in that context to write 
write and write and write. My handwriting's bad, so I just type and type and type. But for you, it might be, man, this is a book about God's word. I'm going to set myself up to have, I'm going to read this book with the book here, my Bible here, my notebook here. And this is the kind of book that I need to sit at a desk when I read. This isn't my couch book. This isn't my plain book. This isn't my beach book. This is my, my desk book because it's that content and I need to master it. And there's other books that it's just going to be miserable to read it at your desk. It's the kind of book, a, a good history, a good biography, maybe a, one of those um, heart-shepherding, worship-inducing books. I, I just need my heart to be affected. It's a great book to, to read in a chair with a cup of coffee a pencil to highlight or maybe a highlighter in your thing. Or maybe for me, when, I, when I'm exercising, if I'm going on a walk, I'd love to have an audio book going, have my mind, not passively receiving, but thinking about it. And I actually usually have an audio book and then a digital copy of the book. And I'm reading it as I walk, as I'm thinking. And, and for me, that, that provides great retention. But I'm not going to be able to stop and write and think deeply. So I, I need to choose... You need to choose which books you read and which spots. Be purposeful in what you read, how you read it, and then the, the format. Be purposeful in the, the, the format of your reading. We have so many options available to us. Don't just read it in the option that you have because that's, that's what's in front of you. Um, if, yeah, if we have so much, so much uh, at our disposal so many benefits. Be purposeful in what you choose. Be purposeful in the context of your reading, whether it's a quiet desk, a quiet chair, out loud as a family, out loud to yourself while exercising. If there's distractions or something you need to make sure there's no distractions for, audiobook on a commute or while you walk, there's some books you can read while doing other tasks, uh, like housework or something like this. Um, or listen to. Some books that you can read at bedtime. There's others you, you probably need to read wide awake, interacting. This is Just be purposeful in what you read, when, and why. In this last one, in be purposeful, I would I'd say be purposeful in reviewing it when you're done. Have you ever finished a book and been like, all right, done with that, on to the next? Sometimes the most important part of reading the book thinking about it for a couple days, going back. Just like before you start a book, you should probably skim it to be familiar with its topics. Is this a book I want to read? What's where? Uh, help choose the, the, the place and how you read it. When you're done, go back through. Review your notes. Review your highlights. Different depths for different types of books. Write a biography. If it's just something, yeah, that was a great story. I highlighted a few things. Skim back still. See the highlighted points. And then come up with the conclusion. All right, how should this affect me? That's, you, those who, who know me know that when, when I read God's word, that's, that's my question. What does this reveal about God's word and how mu or about God and how must this affect me? Ask a similar question with really any book that you read, even if it's not a, a Christian book, but any book. Does this have to affect me? What, what, first, what did this say? And then second, how, how must this affect me? Be able to write in one or two sentences, what's this book about? If it's something more important, be able to write one or two sentences what's, what it's about, and then bullet point the argument. Bullet point the point, and then at the end, write, how must this affect me? Might be one sentence, it might be a huge to-do list, but be purposeful in your reading, not only to read what you ought to read in the way you ought to read it, but take the time to interact with it, um, to, to review it when you're done. And that'll get to the point of be applicative. And then finally, be, be purposeful in either persevering or quitting. Meaning, have you ever read a book and you're just like, man, this isn't what I thought it was. This is really, really hard. I, I hate reading this book. That might mean you need to persevere. And that might mean you just need to put it down. Uh, but don't, don't put it down when you ought to persevere and don't persevere when you ought to put it down. Uh, be purposeful. I mean, just be thoughtful about it. Don't, don't just quit because you want to. 
and don't just persevere because you said you were going to read it. Um, I am going to save the last six topics. I'm, we're going we're gonna to haul next week. The be humble. Be uh, all the, the next. Be humble. Be consistent. Be active. Be discerning. Be applicative. And be delighted. We're going to talk about that next week. I'll, I'll be a lot, a lot quicker on those points. I, I wanted to lay out for you today why reading is important. And, and I, would, I would say it's, it's because we, God made us to learn. Right, God made you, he gave you a mind, gave you the ability to think, and he put his most important truths in a form that have to be understood with words. And we have the benefit of being literate. Not all people have had this benefit. And we have not only the benefit of being literate, but having near endless books at our disposal on almost any topic you can imagine. We would do well to take advantage of that blessing um, and do it with a heart, with a humble heart that, that really wants to worship. If you learn about math and you do it without a heart that worships, the one who created a, a universe that follows these, these rules, so, so predictable, created a, a structure that, that we, a structure of universe, a structure of reality and logic that we can start to break apart in math. If you do that and you don't just worship, you, you miss an opportunity. If you, if you can read about the eye or the ear or the heart or metabolism, these, these are things I like, science things, and you, and you just are content to say, I, oh, that's cool. I, I learned about that. Um, and you don't worship. You're, you're missing a mark. If you learn about history and you don't stand in awe to God who, rise, who raises kings, crushes empires, and is controlling every aspect of history to accomplish exactly his will, and you don't respond in faith and worship, you're, you're missing an opportunity. And so if you are literate, and I think you all are, um, the ability to read without the practice of reading, I think Mark Twain said something like this, if, if, you, if you have the ability to read but you don't read, you're no better off than the one who can't. And if you can, you ought to, and don't just read as an end in and of itself, but read as an end to really part, part of your disciplining yourself for godliness. So that as you learn, as you learn about God and as you learn about the world that he made, and as you seek to live a life to honor him, uh, you do it for his glory. Books are a sweet means to that end. So for next week, or, and then even if, if we had to go on from that, if, if you have any just practical questions, please email them to me. If you're like, hey, make sure you talk about this in reading, or this is a particular challenge I have in reading, um, question you, you'd want to answer. Can you email that to me so I can make sure I, I hit, it, hit it next week or in, in weeks to come? And now let's pray and, and go out there and fellowship. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this morning where you're gathering your body together. Uh, thank you for the privilege of being your children. And not just individual children, but, but children that, that you've saved, given a gift, and then saved and brought into this body. And thank you that we will be here corporately gathered with the opportunity to love one another, to serve one another, to learn together. And I pray that each part of the body as we go out from this room and then come back to this room, that we, we would be diligent to have our minds off ourselves and that we would discern the body, that we would see others, serve them well, glorify you as we do it uh, for, like, uh, to honor you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.